Good morning, good morning. How are you? What a lovely day. It is. Let me uh, do a bit of deep frosting. I'm going to go the scenic way today. Haven't made a video for a while. Been on holiday. Two weeks in the Gambia. Hello, what are they doing? Something going on in the field up there. Let's not get T boned by the Kent Dairy Company. Oh no, what's that sign saying? It's road ahead closed. Yeah. Good job it's in my rear view mirror. Talking of mirrors, we'll get the mirror adjusted. Oh minutiae of life. So it's my first day back at work. Got my Christmas coat on, look, my Eskimo coat. My Inuit coat. And uh, of course in Gambia it's 32 degrees. So you come back to the UK where it's like four or six degrees or something. While I was away, there was a really cold snap. There's, there's always a cold spell in the middle of January. January the 14th, I think, traditionally is the coldest day. In my experience, I have researched that. The, uh, <laughs> I used to drive a Ford Sierra and I crashed it in the snow on the 14th of January. In uh, Medway Towns, they'd had a gritus strike and I decided to drive down a hill those were the days when I was young and bold and stupid and uh, relied on this car to hold its grip going down uh, a big hill covered in snow and ice which was a stupid thing to do yeah I mean you know I might as well have just driven it off the top of a ski jump like Eddie the Eagle Edwards Anyway, it just slid down and then eventually slid somebody else and T-boned it coming up. That was the last time I bought a new car because uh, I was uh, so frozen to death in the weeks and months that followed while I was fighting with the insurance company to uh, try and get this car replaced that um, I just made my mind up that I was going to drive any old banger in the future and just not pump a load of money into new cars, which immediately depreciated, you know. There's all sorts of things that you learn when you're young. Uh, for example, when I went in to order this car, they said, oh, you know, you can specify what you'd like. You know, you can specify the colour, you can specify the... Uh, upholstery colour and the dashboard and the steering wheel and everything so uh, I went in and they made me fill in this big long questionnaire and he said right well we'll get that organised he said now uh, I have to tell you he said this is probably going to take three four months to get this ordered but if you want he said I've got one in the uh, on the forecourt he says it's not the colour you want and it's not the upholstery you want uh, in fact, it's a bit of a mismatch. It was like a brown car with, uh, or a blue car with brown upholstery or something. But he said, uh, uh, but it is the CC that you're after and it's, uh, and I can let you have it like tomorrow. And I said to him, what's the point of me going through the whole business of specifying it and you not telling me that I can't have this car for months? Uh, and then you're trying to sell me this one. Well, he said, well, we can do a very good price on it for you. Uh, because we're trying to shift it and um and i said to what well, what's going to happen well basically they're going to order the one that i specified and that was going to arrive in two or three months and uh i said so someone else is going to be driving around in the car that i ordered and he said yeah that's right so well, i said well why don't you let them specify their own car and he said well we just get in what what the uh, you know we like to get people to um uh, specify the cars for us. We don't. We don't like to uh, make these decisions ourselves because we're very hot on consumer choice. You know, we want to get cars in that the consumers themselves said that they would want to buy. 
So I'm thinking, well, first of all, there's not much point because the ones that they say that they would want to buy, they're not going to get to buy. They're going to get to buy the ones that somebody else has said they wanted to buy. And then secondly, it appeared to me that the bloke had specified this car, either they would had ordered it at random or they just ticked every single box. Because the bloke said, look, oh, you can buy the one on the forecourt, but can you just fill in this form saying, saying uh, what we should replace it with? And he just ticked like the worst boxes he could, thinking that some I'll have a joke, you know, and I'll just specify a clown car. Oh, so that was my experience with buying a new car. And then I crashed it at something like 12 months, two weeks after it, I bought it. So uh, if I crashed it 12 months minus two weeks, they would have bought me a new car. But because it was 12 months plus two weeks, it was like, uh, no, you can have a you can have a second hand car because just after 12 months it's regarded as second hand. And the problem with Ford Sierras, I mean, you can imagine the Ford Sierra had come out, right? It's about 18 months after the Ford Sierra had come out, and I'm looking for a second hand car. And the only Ford Sierras that were on the market 18 months after the launch were ones that had been driven by reps who had like 100,000 miles on the clock and stank of cigarettes because they've been smoking all the time they've been driving. So none of them, none of them was in anything approaching the uh, condition of my car, which was, you know, having been 12 months and one, you know, two weeks old, still smelled like a new car. I've been polished and washed every Sunday and driven like a single private owner would drive, not, not like some rep would drive who had uh, been told that they're gonna, you know, they'd come top of the sales charts and they were gonna spend the next year driving around in, in the brand new Ford Sierra. So uh, it took a long time before I got a replacement car. That was my, my nascent love affair with cars was over. So now I, um, I stick to my, hello. Oh no, you're turning it, that's good. I stick to the principles which I decided sitting on a freezing platform in Whitstable with a bicycle in the winter, uh, which is that uh, on the basis that anything that goes from A to B and that's got a heater and a radio is all I need. So that's why I'm driving this whole wreck. <laughs> My wife says to me, get yourself a decent car. I said, why don't you get yourself a decent car? You can afford to, she says, you can afford to. So, I'm like, no. Why should I? Why should I? I mean, I, yeah, I'd love to have a Tesla. I'd love to have a Tesla. A ludicrous version. But, uh, What would it add to my life, other than a bunch of, uh, you know, I, 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 don't, uh, I had to let go, I had to my, <laughs> get my tentacles off a ton of money that is currently in my bank account, and uh, I always work on the basis that money is better off in your bank account than somebody else's, and you can use that principle when you go shopping, I'll give you that for nothing. You go to a shop, you walk in, you see something and you think, oh, I'd quite like that. So, and then what you do is just, just take five seconds and ask yourself this question. Is the money that it will cost to buy this thing better off in my bank account or in the bank account of the shop? And I think you will find nine times out of 10, you will decide that the money it would cost to buy that thing is probably better off in your bank account than the shop's bank account. If the shop gets it in its bank account, then it's won, isn't it? That's the that's the that's the battle it's trying to fight. It's trying to the battle of trying to move your money into its bank account. Nice bit of driving. Nice bit of sign placement.
Dear me, what a... Why are they closed the road now? Anyway, I'll have to remember to come this way back home. So the Gambia, what can I tell you about the Gambia? Well, it's a country, it's in Africa. It's a former British colony. It's basically all the land that's won cannonballs with from uh, either side of the Gambia River because the British apparently sailed in Senegal and, and, and took possession of all the land either side of the river, which was the, the useful land, you know. And uh, there's no time difference. It's about six hours flying away. It's, uh, the hotels are the same as, you know, the top end hotels are the same as any of the top end hotels that you'd find anywhere sunny. Uh, probably not as not as top as the you know we're not talking about the Maldives or anything here, but but certainly up, up there with anything you'd get in Spain or Portugal or whatever, Greece or Turkey. <coughs> the weather is very uh, nice, considering you'll be flying out of a British winter into something which is going to be somewhere between 28 and 36 degrees, depending on when you go exactly. It varies, you know, you have like a hot week and then they have a not, not so... So a hot week for them would be like 34, 36. And then a not so hot week would be like 28, 32. Pretty much sunny all the time. You know, factor 50 sun cream, as you can see. I've not, I've not got a massive tan because I didn't really go to get radiation burns. Although a lot, I saw a lot of people with them. Um... I went with the Gambia Experience, which is a tour operator, and you pretty much have to go there with them because they've got the best flights. So, for example, they've got a flight, they, they fly during the day, and uh, so I went out, like, uh, took off at 8.30, got there about, uh, you know, mid one o'clock, two o'clock, and then when you're coming back, you uh, oh, I'm going to tuck him behind this lorry. I'm not going to. Oh, hello! They're taking some of the logs away. That's very strange. Or they could be putting some more logs on there. I don't know. Yeah. So, and again, it's a nice flight back. You know, you take off at four. You should get back about ten. But in our case, uh, because the plane was overloaded not overloaded but was heavy um, and um, they uh, <clears throat> and it was very hot it was 34 degrees we took off at like four o'clock in the afternoon 34 degrees and um, so they uh, didn't have um, they couldn't put enough fuel on board to both take off and fly all the way back to Gatwick so they had to put a, a, a bit on to uh, take off and then uh, stop in at Faro on the way back and so as a result we didn't land until about midnight when that was a bit of a pain in the do not eight hours on a plane with one toilet between about 150 people fights over the toilet fights over whether or not to sit down while we were refueling Everybody been sat down for six hours and they stop and start refueling and then they tell everybody they're not allowed to stand up until we take off again. You know, it's just... Anyway, the thing to do is just to... to you know, you have to get through air travel. I mean, air travel used to be enjoyable when I was younger. I used to look forward to flying. My wife still looks forward to flying. Uh, one of my children is a pilot, and, and my son-in-law is a pilot. So, you know, I sort of, uh, and, and I'm a pilot. <laughs> I fly a light aircraft, although that's not really relevant to the question of whether of commercial aviation and the sort of experience that you have to go through. You know, I mean, you're they've, they've stopped asking you to take your shoes off now, and. Uh, 
but they still confiscate. If you've got a bottle of water, they'll still confiscate it out of your backpack as you go through reception, or a bottle of wine or something. And they say, well, hey, look, you know, you're not allowed to take it through. You should put it in your in your um, hand, in your sack, as they call it, your box, <laughs> your suitcase. But um, you know, by the time it gets confiscated, it's too late, isn't it? I lost a perfectly. I've lost a couple of perfectly good pen knives because I forgot I had them in my pocket, and they get confiscated. And at that point, how how the hell can you get it back in your suitcase? Gone. You can't even put it in a padded bag and and give them the postage and ask them to post it to your home, which is I would have thought was a fairly obvious you know way to recover a personal property as opposed to having it scrapped. So, the Gambia's got some Airbnbs. Um, what I would do is I would say that I think you have to understand that pretty much everybody in Gambia is on the make. You know, they call them the, the uh, but they're sort of, uh, <laughs> they're not like dangerously on the make, but they're just all out with that. They've all got an eye out for the main chance. So, for example, if you're walking down the beach, they'll sort of shout at you, come on, buy, buy my juice. Or um, they're walking up and down trying to sell you sunglasses or belts. Stuff, just the usual stuff, you know. Uh, and uh, it, it, when you go there the first time, there is, there is a tendency to sort of try and, you know, you do think to yourself, well, if I can help people, I will. Um, and so you'll probably end up doing stupid things, like giving someone 300 quid to help put their child through school for the year or something. Just random acts of kindness, you know. Um, this is the third time I've been there. So, and you get used to the rubbish. There's nobody, there's no... The, the, the lesson I think that I want everyone to take away from Gambia is that they are uh, zero carbon, or as close to zero carbon as you can get. But, you know, and, and, it, and the sort of society that you might on the face of it think that we should all aspire to. But in fact, the, uh, there's no way that they are as low carbon as they declare. Because, uh, for example, the rubbish, what do you do with your rubbish? Well, I think they've got one dust cart with Ola Banjul. And that spews diesel fumes out the back. Uh, p pollution there is pretty bad. I don't think they've got any MOTs or any sort of uh, vehicle inspections. Their attitude is, you know, if you say like they should get some of the worst death trap taxis off the roads, their attitude is, well, why? But you're going to put someone out of a job if you do that. You're, you know, you're, you're taking someone's livelihood away from. Them. They all want a chance to earn. Well, it's not much money. I mean, you can get by on, on 300 quid a month in Gambia. That includes accommodation and food, um, and electric and a mobile phone, which is about all you need, really. You know, uh, the clothes are donated from charities. They come in in big plastic bags. They're sold for about uh, 20 quid a bale. And um, then somebody unpacks them and sorts them and tries to sell them. So clothes don't cost much. Uh, they've got quite link, uh, links with China and that, so footwear and cheap electrical goods again. Not quite well, well, cheap electrical, but they, they do do without stuff that you and I would take for granted. For example, I mean, try and find a a pin, even a pin. <laughs> Can't find a pin. If you want to change your SIM card, forget, you know, trying to find one of those SIM card changing things. Try, you know, you, you can't, nobody's got anything. Nobody's got a pencil or a piece of paper or a tissue. Uh, nobody's got anything there, you know, they just make, if they want to, um, if they want to clean the floor, they won't have a mop or a bucket or a sponge or a flannel or anything. They'll just, 
pour water on it and just rub their hands on it. This is a zero carbon economy. And if you want to get rid of your rubbish, then what you do is you um, you, you uh, stick it on the back of a bloke who comes along with a, do a car, donkey and car, and these poor emaciated donkeys drag it all the way out to the public tip, which is on fire and has been on fire for the last 30 years. And, uh, and that's where the carbon goes, you know, it goes into landfill and is then burnt. In the same way as Mauritius, you know, when they cut the, the sugar cane and they, the bits that they don't want, they just burn it. And so you've got, you've got these massive bonfires running all day and all night. And if you don't want to give it to a bloke on a donkey, then you take it down the end of the street and chuck it in a ditch and, and set, when there's enough of it, someone will set fire to it there. So that's where your rubbish goes. So the place does resemble a bit of a massive great rubbish tip. You have to get used to that. There are no bins or anything like that. You know, nobody throws anything in it. There are no public bins. There are no public services. But then there's probably not much in the way of tax either or uh, government other than the president. So it's a real tropico game in real life. And dogs, you know, the friendly dogs, but dogs everywhere. So anyway, I've not, I know I appreciate it. I haven't really sold Gambit. <laughs> the people are lovely. And uh, you know, your typical day involves sleeping in late, getting up, having breakfast, fry up, and then uh, going for a walk on the sandy beach, cup of tea, play a bit of chess. Walk back down the beach, bit of chocolate, more chess, sleep, wake up, dinner, nightclub, stay up late, go back, go to sleep, wake up, 10 o'clock the next day, rinse and repeat. Nice, nice, and, and, and sort of pretty much out of your normal routine, you know, it sort of gets me out of my being a fat white middle-aged dentist at the arse end of Kent routine. All right, lovely. Well, nice to talk to you. <laughs> Bit odd, odd, odd subjects today, weren't they? Okay, see you soon. Bye.